Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, PDSE 2024. It's the second day and we are here at the famous Uranium Booth, Uranium Energy Corporation. And with me here is Scott Melby, the executive vice president of the company. Scott, always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, How are you? It's <laughs> great to see you and uh, talk about Uranium at this exciting time in, in the market. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I'm a shareholder in both companies, of course. We have uh, just let both uh, roll ups here because they are so closely related together. But let's start with uh, UEC. Um, your stock had a great run up and uh, I still said uh, I think uh, some earlier presentation I said uh, thank you very much for the short <laughs> seller last year in March because I got again the stock at two dollar thirty six <laughs> it was fantastic yeah. and so now we are uranium or yeah shortly close to 100 we have been already over 107 yeah. um, so before we go into you see maybe from you as the real <laughs> uranium professional what is your view on the market yeah, it's really quite simple. Uh, we've gone from a uranium market that was oversupplied by inventories, yeah. secondary supplies. We had a structural deficit between what the world consumed and what the world was mining, but it didn't matter because the inventories were the buffer. Um, but we've had you know production discipline now for several years that have cut back supplies. We've seen the entrance of Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and other investors in the physical commodity. Mm -hmm. Basically, sop up all the the excess inventories to a point now where we're in a production driven market so it now matters when we have production guidance from Kazatomprom or Cameco or other producers uh, it matters to the market because those pounds are needed um, and I and I also you know mentioned too that you know uranium is not an efficient commodity like copper silver zinc where um, if you had a doubling of the uranium price from 50 to 100 dollars like we've seen in 12 months um, in the copper industry, there would be mines in South America, Africa, that would be coming in to moderate the increase. Uranium doesn't have that because we've missed a number of investment cycles in both exploration, mine development. So now that uranium price is running, we need eight to 10 new mines coming online around the world. Uh, I see visibility to four or five. Uh, a number of these are in the United States, which is great news. Uh, also, you know, a couple mines in, in Africa and Australia but well, we need eight to six, yep. eight, 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 you know, six to eight more additionally, and those are going to have to go through lengthy permitting, licensing, construction, yeah. uh, and are maybe in parts of the world of sub-Saharan Africa or Kazakhstan. So we're in a very classic supply squeeze. Demand's Definitely. growing, nuclear's growing, yeah. production's lagging, inventories are gone. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I see it the same way. Uh, so I mean. $150 in uranium should be not a problem for this year. That's how yeah. I see it. Yeah. Um, even more important is for me with UEC, you just released uh, in January, I think it was, that you want to go again back into production by right. August. So how does it look like? Is all yeah, on, on, well, uh, on the pass? Uh, you know Amir Adnani's strategy to, yes. to be a contrarian and embrace the inevitable down cycles in, in the commodity like we had a very long, prolonged uh, bear market for 10, 12 years, we were very active. We made 600 million in acquisitions, mm -hmm. including Uranium One, yep. right before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we got those Russian assets in the heart of the Powder River Basin of Wyoming back in yeah. American for hands. For a beautiful price, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. <laughs> Wouldn't be that price today. <laughs> no. <laughs> but what's great is it it gives us our fastest uh, re-entry back into production at Christensen Ranch Irrigary, which we've announced a restart of operations in August. We've been prepping those uh, operations for the last 12 months, getting ready for this, making the final remaining hires mm. and eager to be back into production in a facility that can produce all in cost of around $40 a pound. Wow. And we're an unhedged seller, which is exactly. very unique. We didn't lock up all our production you know, for the next you know, five to eight years at prices reflecting the last five years. Um, we're completely open to what yeah. this new market will bring. Yeah. Uh, we think that will deliver the highest average selling price to our investors. Uh, my job is not to hedge utilities upside price risk. It's to give the investor it's their problem. Yeah, <laughs> give the investor the highest price. So exactly. we're doing that. How many pounds do you think you can do this year and then from next year onwards? What yeah, would be so, the capacity? Um, <clears throat> the first uh, year of production from August to July of next year. Um, we haven't given firm guidance yet because we're honestly still looking at ways to see what can we do to produce more. But I think the street uh, consensus guidance on, on our first year production of around a half a million pounds is a safe assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we'll try to do more. Uh, but the, the ramp up to one to two million pounds a year uh, at Irrigary Christensen Ranch, remember then we'll also 
phase in Reno Creek, which is 50 miles away with 27 million pounds of resources. So not only do we have fast, uh, quick response uh, production into the market, mm -hmm. but we have uh, lasting, and then we have more ranch and ludamen to sustain. At the same time, we're, we're developing Burke Hollow in Texas. By the second half of next year, uh, we'll be in production at Burke Hollow, again, ramping up to the one to two million pounds, with the goal to be producing five to six million pounds in the U.S. by the end of this uh, decade. Yeah. And certainly have a great line of sight to that that happening between Texas and Wyoming. Yeah, and I would say the huh. U.S. desperately needs yeah. your uranium because as far my numbers were like, U.S. were importing 99% of the used uranium, and I think this is still rising, the demand. So yeah. you have it uh, in front of your, if you're gauged, you can sell, right? Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, we, we am, we've been importing most of our uranium to date, but you know, 50% of the uranium that the U.S. uses for 20% of its production of, of electricity from nuclear power comes from Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. Um, You know, we, we kind of opened up after the, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union and welcomed uh, the Russian sphere of influence into our markets. Now we can't run away fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Congress passed the Nuclear Fuel Security Act that would authorize an expansion of the uh, strategic uranium reserve to a strategic enriched uranium reserve. Mm -hmm. um, this week, we're very optimistic that uh, Congress will pass an appropriations bill Uh, at, at, to the tune of about 2.7 billion <coughs> that would fund that. And okay. what's important is the bill is written with a, a very strong condition that the funds will not be dispersed unless there is a Russian uranium ban. So these are always been two parts of, of, of the equation, but we don't get one without the other. So it'll really put uh, pressure to get the Russian ban uh, pushed over the, the, mm -hmm. the okay. finish line. So that means the... <coughs> The politics are really supportive for production of U.S. uranium on U.S. soil, I would call yeah. it. Yeah. So that would benefit all producers by now, but also future producers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're we're onshoring. I think we realize that you know outsourcing critical minerals, rare earth minerals, strategic uh, commodities to countries like Russia and China that don't share our values uh, was a mistake. And now we're really uh, trying to rapidly correct that and regain our energy security, energy independence. And it's great news for the uranium industry. I'm the head of the Uranium Producers of America. Um, we have five member companies that have either announced restart or are restarting. Uh, that's really great news for, for the Western United States, for American uh, energy picture. Yeah, super. And I think you have also a lot uh, else in the portfolio, of course, where you can yep. build on the future, like Rough Rider, for example. Yep. I think that might be something for uh, the next decade, probably. Yeah, so Rough Rider is a world-class 50 million uh, pound deposit, 5% ore grades, uh, just kilometers from the McLean Lake Mill in Saskatchewan. I think this is one of those key assets that uh, as, you know, MacArthur and Cigar are going to produce at their full capacity as announced by, by Cameco recently, um, there is a need for the next generation of mines and Rough Rider is one of those uh, deposits that will, will fit that, that billing. And so we're very excited. We'll release an economic study by, July, uh, by June of this year that will detail what the development timeline is, what the cost, the capital cost to develop, uh, pr projected production cost, milling options, all those things. Uh, so we'll have a lot more information on, on Rough Rider. But I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume, you know, 2030 uh, would be the fastest startup. But yeah. in this market, maybe that's achievable. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I see it the same way, definitely. Um, what else do you think in the portfolio of UEC is something then which should be pushed forward the next five years? Yeah, well, I, I think our focus, it's not It's not coincidental we're in Texas, Wyoming, and Saskatchewan. We think those are the three best jurisdictions for resource development in, in North America. The fact that we're in North America is, is, a, is a response to the geopolitical risks in the world today. So um, I think you'll see us build around the central processing hubs at Irrigary in Wyoming and Hobson in Texas, and you'll see us building and expanding around those hubs. So I think we have you know, uh, ultimately we'll have eight and a half million pounds of licensed capacity. I think look for us, rather than to start making acquisitions in other countries that kind of take us away from our core focus, mm -hmm. that's not really our, our game. It's really get those mines into production. Yeah. Um, I think one thing to mention too is we're going through a process now 
um, to look and, and put a price on the titanium project in Paraguay, which um, is a world-class, one of the largest undeveloped titanium deposits in the world. I say this not because we want to get into the titanium business, we don't, but we want to monetize that that will provide capital for uh, our, our uranium mine development. So UEC from the U.S. could be throwing off 300, 350 million a year in free cash flow from Texas and Wyoming. We could be bringing in um, uh, additional capital from the sale of the titanium asset. The study we, we performed said for just a portion of the ore body, yeah. the value is somewhere between 400 million and 1.5 billion. So um, we, we'll kind of hold your applause until we go through the process and see what kind of response we get. But that would provide a lot of capital, particularly for Saskatchewan, which will be a higher capital cost development. In the U.S., the rule of thumb is 1 million pounds of each additional annual production uh, achieved comes at a $25 million investment. That's nothing. Mm. And it's capitalizing on, on infrastructure. Absolutely. And with those margins... <laughs> Given the fact that uh, uranium should be soon at 150, I mean, yeah. you can earn then 100 million. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can't produce fast enough now. So. Absolutely. No, that's super. Um, if we go back shortly to the deficit in the market, yeah. and it looks to me like, let's say, until the end of the decade, the U.S. could maybe produce something around 15 <clears throat> million pounds, maybe 20 by themselves. Yeah. No, that's, that's but reasonable. But still, that yeah. does not eliminate a deficit, right? No. Um, and so, you know, I think we need uh, Western mines to address Western needs. Yeah. Um, clearly, Russia and China can't rely on uranium sources that are dependent on, on Russia or on, on the EU, the UK yeah. or the United States. So they're really focusing on Namibia and, and parts of Africa. They're really gobbling up the assets in Kazakhstan. And that's fine. They have Kazakhstan in that part of the world. We have Canada and the United States and Australia. Yeah, so exactly. I think, uh, you know, for companies in that, that sphere, and that kind of brings us to Uranium Royalty, where UEC is an example of a company that will be early to fill that gap. We want to be the capital provider for that entire cohort of companies like UEC mm -hmm. that will be able to fill the gap in Australia, Africa, U.S., and Canada. So uh, for us to have the royalty and streaming model in the Uranium commodity at this point in the cycle uh, is really exciting. So we have very uh, big, big plans for URC. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> you want to already talk about URC or shall we do it separately? <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, listen, we'll, we'll have another interview, but I, I just, uh, there are two ways to invest yes. in the uranium story. Um, one is more of a diversified, almost an ETF approach to uranium. Yeah. We have 20 royalties on 18 projects. We have 2.5 million pounds of physical uranium and uranium royalty. The value of that is approaching our, our current market cap. So obviously we're trading below our, our value right now. So it is a good entry point. I think for all you know, in the uranium space, you've seen in the last two or three weeks a pullback, which I think is more of a healthy consolidation rather than any signaling of any fundamental shift. Yeah. So uh, URC will uh, will do very well with that $350 million in, in uranium value. That can be turned to cash to make investments in, in mines. We've got six to seven projects kind of we're, oh. we're chasing right now okay. uh, in, in all the various uranium districts of the world. And we're funded to, to do the, the 25, 50, even $100 million deals uh, in the royalty space. Fantastic. So that sounds like a game plan, I would say. And yep. also UEC is still heavily undervalued to me. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so we're going to have big fun here in the future. I'm very happy for the, for the uranium investor who's persevered. They've yeah. hung in there. They believed. Yeah. Uh, this is the time that they're going to see their uranium investments really Definitely. shine. So yeah. exciting time. I know why I'm a shareholder. Good. <laughs> We're glad you are. Scott, thank you very yeah. much for that. Thanks, Super. Johan. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was Scott Melby, the executive vice president of Uranium Energy Corporation. And yeah, you heard it. The world is bright. The world is shiny. Thanks to uranium. The prices are fantastic. There are little consolidation by now. But this is exactly what you want to have because you can now still buy again cheaply into Uranium Energy Corporation. Operation. And this is what I did also. And yeah, I think we have a super great future the next years here. And uh, make sure you have some stock. Thanks for watching us and bye bye from PDAC 2024.